Anyway, uh, we can talk about what work, what matters, and what sort of evidence there is behind there about um, what GPs could, could do. Um, so some common themes, this is what Karen um, talked about. Um, was, there was a little survey for the group that you sort of fed back, or at least some of you fed back and said, oh, these are things I want to talk about, paper, electricity, disposable items. Um, there's this concept came, kept coming through about GPs don't often own their premises. I, I heard, here's, I can do what I like, I like that. Um, but that's not the case for many of the GPs. They may not own the business nor the premise. Um, and so it's tricky to do with that concept of electricity. Bec you, know, you can plead, please. Uh, you can move to another set of the cares like his. Um, certainly, you could, I, I just put these, these are just a few thoughts. I mean, the LED ones, I know, certainly within households, every, everyone, I and mean, that just seems really easy one, the LED. Lo, lo, <clears throat> um, the, the, because they're installed free anyway. So I, I just hope that everyone's got LEDs everywhere rather than halogens because certainly in Victoria, they come and install them for nothing. In my house, they just came, they turned up and they said, we'll change it. I said, oh, okay. That was five years ago. Um, and we'll talk a bit about disposable items. The other really big one, I think, is pharmaceutical waste. I think it's a really interesting one. I think that that concept of not wasting things, one of the things we're discovering, doing some research on and more in this space in the next... Uh, little while, um, we'll be just looking at how energy intensive it is to make drugs. Um, so just there, are, there is a little bit, so you probably, some of you probably know Grant Blaschke and a group uh, 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 who are interested in this area and there's a few little publications in the Australian Family Physician, I alert you to those publications which are now getting on. But um, they, they were a good little, these are fairly obvious things, I'll just go through them. These, these are things you already know and in fact have been very nicely uh, described by Dr. Angel just uh, before me. But, and, and look, some of these things are hard, like, I mean, buy green power, that always costs more, you know. So these are sort of things that may not be easy to do. I mean, one, one and two save money, three always cost money, which is uh, a shame. Um, some of the other things are relatively straightforward things to do, but others are, are not so much. Um, the recycled paper is an interesting one because, uh, you, so you know roughly there's no point in buying, and I'm, this is not, I'm not against recycling, I'm very much in favour of recycling, but so the life of um, that paper cup there might last six cycles. After that, you can, the, the fibres are ruined, destroyed. So you can never really have more than, say, talking about 100% recycled paper is not actually a realistic proposition. So somewhere like 75%, that sort of thing is probably where you start to get beyond it because after that, it, um, it just falls apart. So you have to always add, be adding virgin stuff in. Uh, a lot of them do. Yeah, a lot of them do. So, so I think Dr. Tate is leading the way here, uh, as there are a few others. So it's reusing is the issue. And I always say that. Recycling is fine, but reusing, reducing is, is the way to go. Um, so this is what uh, Dr. Blaschke and the Australian Conservation Foundation group did. You probably may already have heard about this little green cl clinic project. You might have been involved. But um, we had 20 GPs turn up, and 12 of them actually did it, and seven actually completed the project. And it was just the surveys of what did they do afterwards. And these are just some of the simple things they did, um, which Dr. Angels also uh, talked about in great more detail. Yeah, we're sort of talking about some of the effects. We're fairly, um, fairly big users of CO2, um, but that some of the things like reducing the amount of travel, re reducing the amount of leaking taps, some fairly obvious sorts of things that are not that hard to do. So that was some of the... Um, the, the surveys. Um, so, I, and I, but what I want to take a step back and say that really what matters is being involved in public health. I think so. We, we heard about smoking beforehand and how that will, you know, redu improve the uh, health of a kid, uh, uh, the unborn child, etc. But I, I think that's so massive. Just stopping one person smoking will stop me seeing that patient in intensive care five times, as well as the thoracic surgeon doing his operation for lung cancer, as well as everything else that goes with it. And you know, alcohol is the same. Drug use. Uh, obesity, diabetes, exercise, you know, those co-benefits. I think, I think that's actually the really, really big picture. I think what you're doing is fantastic, and what I try to do is I, I hope good too, but I do think that just doing your daily job well and being preventive is actually extremely important. And uh, so I think the role of the GP, when you think, oh, I'm not doing anything, in fact, you actually are doing a lot if you're involved in preventive medicine because the footprint of what you're trying to reduce is, is actually quite massive. Um, so the areas are likely... Likely the highest impact, I think we've we've talked to Angel sort of seen is that it's all about you know heating and ventilation. That in, you know in Queensland it's going to be the air conditioning, but it's not light that's the big story. It's not the lighting that uses the amount of energy. It's, it's anything to do with heating or ventilation. Um, water I would have thought is not so much of a major concern. I don't know what your water bill is, but I wouldn't have thought it'd be very big in a, in a GP oh, setting. No, do you, know, you have a rough idea how much you're spending? Five thousand. Okay, that actually does surprise me. different parts of Brisbane, different trades, and 
Right. Oh, privatization of the water, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like in Victoria then. But there's issues with drought. Sorry? There's issues with drought. Yes. Um, oh, I'm not saying it's not a waste of time. I'm just talking about money in terms of trying to save money. Electricity is a bigger way to go than water. If you're trying to save money. Certainly that's my house and my hospital. That's where, that's where the think, focus I is. That's the point that most of us aren't doing it for the money. Most of, and if you look at the, the literature, the literature is most people do these changes because they want to do something for the environment. And they're, they're happy that, that there is sometimes an environmental or, or a financial benefit. Yes, I think that's very different in a hospital. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I, you are correct. I'm an employee at my practice, so I, I, mean, I can't sort of just change things. But if I can perhaps have a financial argument, it might be helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the owner of my practice doesn't isn't necessarily environmentally minded, but if it was going to save you money, you might be interested in finding a more sustainable practice. This might come out in the conversation, but I think if you go, like, if you go to your employer, like I go to my employers, and we make the ecological argument, and then say, and then there are co-benefits of this for your bottom line. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a framing thing, which we might talk about later. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know there's one GP in Aesidus, uh, so don't use any nitrous oxide of death flame because they're really bad. <laughs> okay, I had to throw that in there. Um, here's some electricity consumption for Dr. Cockman's Brisbane Clinic. I don't know if you own that clinic, no, but no. you work for it. Uh, so we've got um, five consulting rooms, um, and you can see 120 kilowatt. So an average Brisbane house is about 20 kilowatt hours a day, total or total consumption. A bit more than Victoria, but not, not much difference. Um, so you've about six houses. So you could almost say that each consulting room, you know, with all the extras, is about the same as a house. So it's, a, it's actually a reasonable amount of electricity when you think about it. So you've got six houses of electricity chugging along. Yeah, just a bit of background. So it's a surgery that is built into a converted row of shops with no insulation in the ceiling and mm. with big glass fronts because it's built alongside the row of shops. So, so it gets all this western sun. Is it yeah. west facing? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, or yeah, very inefficient air conditioning. And what about tinting? Have they done tinting? Uh, Not sure. Okay. Yeah. Good, all good questions. And then by that you just mean that film, the, the yeah, clean the film. film. Yeah. You still, it's looking darker, but you know. It, yeah. But you can make ninety-nine percent UV reduction. As well as reduction of infrared or heat as well. Yeah. So yeah, those, those sort of things, awnings, that sort of thing, yeah. The, the awnings will be relative, oh, sorry, sorry, Peter, but the awning will be expensive compared to the, <laughs> I mean, this obviously is going to be, I mean, this is a place that doesn't have insulation, you know, I mean, that's dramatic, you know. Um, so just by comparison, at Footscray Hospital, 300 beds, you're looking at 50 megawatt hours a day, so you're looking at about a few thousand worth of your clinics, just as an idea, just to give the, the, the step up. Um, I just wanted to, I won't, actually I won't, we probably don't have time to go through this, and, and I'm, if you're all around on Sunday, good on you, if not, we'll have drinkies tonight, we can talk more. We won't, we won't go through this, I will just show you this picture though, um, this, I, I think always people like this, not just because it's a map of Australia, but, um, and New Zealand, but what I'm showing here is the, and, and this is quite relevant at the moment for Tasmania, um, this is, if you've got a kilowatt hour, so all these lights being on for an hour roughly, you're going to produce a certain amount of CO2 from that. And so um, somewhere went on hydro, like New Zealand and Tasmania, um, produce relatively low amounts because they're yeah, hydro and wind and geothermal. Victoria wins badly because we're on brown coal, which is like young black coal, which is what Queensland and New South Wales are on. Um, Western Australia is mainly black coal, even though they export the bucket of gas off to China. Um, South Australia is now about 30% wind, so they've made major inroads, big changes, big changes, and even more with solar thermal, let's hope soon. Uh, and Northern Territory is mainly natural gas. Should be a lot more solar, but it's mainly natural gas. So you can see that in terms of where you are does have important factors. You can see, in fact, very large differences. Tasmania is really interesting at the moment, just as an aside, I know it's not good. But Tasmania is in real trouble with its electricity, if you may have heard. Bass Link um, fell apart for a little while, and so they're now burning diesel generators for their electricity. Um, because they kept selling during the, uh, the periods of getting good money under the carbon price, they were flogging all the electricity and running down on the hydro, and so their dams are dry. And so they're now they're, 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 they can't do it anymore. And so they're having to suddenly import diesel generators. It's a very, very expensive way of trying to get electricity. So just trying to show you that, 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 that it does matter where you are. Even though these, this isn't com quite, com you know, as one of a, an expert would say, it's not completely true because there are 
the whole of the East Coast, or actually the whole of South Australia, Queensland, are all interconnected so um, on the grid. So there, there isn't quite correct what I'm saying, but overall you could sort of say that's where the source of electricity is and it does have important features. Um, uh, I would sort of think, that, you know, these sort of things of, you know, what could you use not so much of. I mean, one thing that is really, it might seem uh, incomplete data, but it's actually pretty robust, is there have been the whole footprints of things looking at air dryers versus paper towels. And you really notice that in airports now, that this, the paper towels have disappeared. And I think that's mainly because of a hassle point of view. But I think it's also... Yeah, and that's, that's, that's right. It's the fact that people use 10 of these jolly paper towels rather than one or two, which is, so it's, it's you know, the fact that it is very wasteful to use paper towels rather than hand, hand, hand dryers. That, that's right, those super duper rocket, rocket explode your hand off sort of ones, you know. Um, there's, there's no doubt that they're better uh, from uh, that point. Through. So I think paper is a major, I think the GPs are actually leading, compared to hospitals, you're miles ahead with your electronic use of, <laughs> certainly most, <laughs> I mean, we, we, we've got a lot of work to do. So I think that that isn't a major issue for GPs. Um, because of the interest of time, we probably don't, but this is an example of something that these are single use in, ho in some parts of ho some hospitals. I'm not saying everything is, but. And in general. Um, and GPs. And GPs. And so that is a very wasteful way, but, but uh, over drinks tonight, I'll be very happy to talk to you about that sort of thing, but it's a very long story. It's a story of globalization and how it's hard to, because this is so damn cheap. It's so cheap to chuck. Um, I don't mean cheap from people point of view or from an environment point of view. I'm just purely from a, point of view. yes, yes. Um, I won't go, and so you can sort of see drug trays. We've, we've looked at the cycles of these sorts of things, finding that in fact, um, if you look at these different things, in, in fact, even in Victoria, where you're looking at the worst case scenario, say for the reusable one, because you're using brown coal, so it's a much worse scenario than you say in Tasmania or New Zealand, where it's all on ge geothermal or hydro, um, it's actually still better to be using these than those from a, from a footprint, including CO2 and water use and petrochemicals and everything else that you want to look for. So, and what is really interesting too is that the cotton, cotton is a shocker uh, for its ecological footprint. The, the footprint of these three grams of cotton is greater than the 20 grams of plastic uh, from a water footprint and a very similar energy footprint. Not only does it take a lot of water to grow, it, the cotton gin takes a lot of energy, a lot of water, and it uses a lot of energy. So it's a very expensive uh, way. And that we've got big problems in the hospitals to deal with, to, you know, the single-use gowns that students wear. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I w but look, once again, with these sorts of things, I, I, these are, you use similar sorts of things. When you start getting into things that are sterilised, the story is a bit more subtle and complex because sterilisation, so the amount of energy to go to boil that, that cup of water to completely boil it into steam is about four or five times as much as going from one degree to 90 degree, 99 degrees because it's a phase change to the gas. So, so when you start boiling water, it becomes very, very energy intensive. And so it just depends a little bit on where you are that in, in, purely from a carbon footprint, it may actually be better to have single use um, for small things that are not, not big surgical sets, but for some small things. But in general, reusable is better even when it's sterilized in most parts of the world. Most times you don't just put one whatever needle holder into the sterilizer. You, you yes. have a whole lot. You know? Correct. Correct. We modelled for that. Okay. We modelled for that. And but I, I understand entirely what you're saying. And we'll get onto that because I want to show you this. This is part of our research. A boring graph, but I think it's a fun graph. So what is this? Is showing we we modelled each dot. One of those dots was a steriliser load in our hospital. So we've got 1,300 steriliser loads over one year. And here's the mass in the steriliser. So we're much bigger than the, you, you're talking about 50, 60 kilograms of stuff in there, you know, so you've got linen, and you've got metalware and plastics, bowls and things like that. And this is the amount of energy divided by the mass. Now what that's trying to show you is that for each kilogram extra that you add to it, it drops in use. You can understand, it's like they're getting the taxi, it's like the flag fall, it's 15 bucks to get into the taxi. And then, you know, so you, you, you're being charged just for starting the thing up. Uh, and what it's trying to show you is you're absolutely correct. As you use more and more, it becomes more and more efficient. I mean, that's fairly obvious. It's just that we quantitated it. And so it's showing that if you've already got stuff in there and you're just adding a little bit more, it's just irrelevant. It doesn't use energy in it at all. We were giving, as I sort of said, the worst case scenario for the reusable, because often you do that deliberately, so you're not accused of being biased but in, in, in your studies. So certainly I agree that really reusable thing, if you're only sterilizing one item, then there's a whole great big steriliser with nothing else in it. That's a, that you shouldn't be doing that. And I think that's what we're trying to show here is that we've got one third of these loads being really small. And I think that's the behavior change that we made in our hospital that, that was really exciting to reduce the amount of these dots and head that way. Um, here's your 
a sterilizer. I think you might recognize that. Um, similar to yours. Yeah. So you're talking, I imagine, so our sterilizers use about 20 kilowatt hours per load. They're big thumping machines. Um, I imagine this is, uses probably two or three kilowatt hours. This would be a fairly small amount, uh, even though it's steam driven. Um, but you can see you can load, and so the way in which you load things is really important. I can see what we call the toaster rack, as we call it in the hospital. So I think that's a really nice, efficient way of actually loading it. It may not look like there's that much in there, but then you can get a lot more that way than just lying it flat, lying one or two. Sometimes you can have several racks, but I think that just the way you, certainly there are rules about how you should sterilise things, and they're really important, but I think that's a very efficient way of how you've actually done that. Um, uh, questions as we keep going? Um, so how we use them is at least as important how they're ma they are made and they use a lot of energy when they're idle. And I just make that point out that, that sterilizers, even when they're not actually running a load, it's like having, I can hear it, the boiler in the background, it's perfect time actually. So that boiler kicking along is using energy just to keep it everything hot. And sterilizers do that as well. So you don't realize that the sterilizer is gently just percolating along, not producing much steam but just keeping it warm. It has a jacket. And the jacket's designed so there's a separate little little thin ribbon of steam that goes into that jacket just to keep it warm inside um, when you need to. Uh, certainly in hospitals, that's the case. I can't I can't be certain if it's the same in the GP clinic, but there, but it may well be. There's often a jacket. Uh, and what we found is we, idle periods are, are problematic, and, and they use lots of energy. So uh, recycling. Um, I think you have to really look into that carefully about who your risk provider is, that sort of thing, because certainly we found a lot of variation in how much money it was going to cost or how much money we we're going to save. It, you've got to try and get some good deals. Um, uh, and, and I think that that concept, you know, the small waste receptacles you sort of see, I think they're great for, because um, in other words, you just have the, the actual waste is a small one. It, it, it's amazing how that changed our behaviour in the hospital. So all the, all the doctors suddenly, instead of having this great big bucket to chuck their stuff away from in the office, they just had this little tiny box and they were really angry. And I, don't, oh, I want more waste, you know. And, and it was amazing how it changed because you had a really small, just for the general waste, and then you had a big recycle, blue recycling bin for paper. And uh, it changed behaviour. There was a lot of anger initially, a lot of angst and woe and gnashing of teeth. But um, eventually we got over that. Uh, here's some phthalates. Sorry, we won't. <laughs> That's PVC with phthalates. Yeah, but anyway, we won't. Basically, this is, we are re at least recycling this rather than burning it. Um, uh, and I think that concept of your role in the healthcare system, I think, as I, as I keep saying, when, when you feel like you're not achieving anything at all, you actually are by, I think, being involved with um, preventative health. Um, and I think that advocacy, you know, just the RACGP, and just looking at, I was just looking at this last night, and just sort of uh, actively supporting community care, uh, committing to effective and efficient use of health resources, I think that's a really important role, and I think that's, well, that's on the college website. So um, I think that, you know, that, that, that could be something that could be promulgated in the wider, with the wider group. Um, so, so thanks for your time. Um, I know I haven't answered and solved any problems. I know that perhaps Dr. Angel actually has, and I'll take my hat off to him, um, but I'll be happy to answer any questions.